Welcome to the MTech Access Words of Wisdom webinar, where each month we'll bring you up-to-date insight from a, a senior NHS leader. We will be exploring the challenges they face, how they may respond to them, what their priorities will be in the short and the longer term. And this is all about connecting you with the people leading the NHS rather than giving your own commentary from the outside. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Claire Fuller, who's the Senior Responsible Officer at Surrey Heartlands Health and Care Partnership. Claire is a GP by background, initially practicing in the Northeast before moving south, who has experienced life as a single-handed GP, also life as a GP within a hospital. A former chair of the National NHS Right Care Clinical Group and NHS Clinical Leader of the Year, who's taken on her current role, having been clinical chair of Surrey Downs CCG. Claire is one of the most qualified people in the country to comment on the changing NHS and particularly the ever-changing world of integrated care. So that is our subject today. It's uh, myth busting within integrated care. So we'll see how we go with that. We've had a lot of questions submitted in advance. I'll try to address as many of those as I can do. Uh, please feel free to ask questions in the chat box uh, and we'll see if we can get some of those uh, if we're not addressing them on the way. So Claire, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Um, obviously a fantastic experience that you've got and a, a really interesting role that you're doing at the moment. Could you just give us a brief introduction to you and the role that you currently perform, what it is and, and what different hats you wear? Yeah, so uh, so I am, I am still a GP, so that's sort of, it's the thing that runs through me as being a, an NHS GP. Um, I lead the Surrey Heartlands Integrated Care System uh, and about eight weeks ago I also took on, I'm now the Accountable Officer for the Surrey Heartlands CCG as well, so I've taken, I've got both roles now. Um, Surrey Heartlands is an integrated care system, we cover a population of 1.1 million, nearly all of Surrey, uh, and have a budget of 1.5 billion uh, and the system is arranged over four patches and each patch has got uh, an acute hospital within that and we start to refer to integrated care partnerships as being all the organisations and the population that flow into that acute hospital. So we've got one system, four ICPs and then 25 primary care networks that all feed up in, into, the, uh, into the integrated care partnerships. One of the uh, unusual things about Surrey is a really close relationship with local authority. Uh, so uh, I'm having taken over the CCG, I'm, I'm in the process of doing a restructuring. Actually, two of my most senior team will be joint roles with the local authority. So joint integrated uh, strategic commissioner and also uh, a public sector reform role that will cover sort of, uh, the public health role. So it's a very different way of working. Um, but in my role as ICS lead, which will be the one that people will be less familiar with, I'm accountable for delivering the money, the finance and the quality of all of the organisations and have no hierarchical power to do that. And I'm also required to produce a plan that improves the health inequalities within Surrey. Wow, <laughs> no shortage of things to keep you busy no. there. Uh, we might get onto a spare time later, but I doubt there's, there's much to explore there. Um, huge amounts obviously that you've been working on over the last, uh, well, well, over the last months and, and years to get to this point, but um, we're going to fast forward just to, given the, the developments over the last few weeks, particularly thinking about the, the publication of the third phase of the COVID response, I think it'd be uh, remiss of me to start anywhere else today. So as, as far as you can tell me, uh, what mm -hmm. are your reflections on the, the third phase plans and how realistic do you think some of the targets are? Yeah, so I think it's important to put the phase three letter in the context of the other two. So they're okay. very much, they come as a trilogy, and I think it's sort of an attempt to over-romanticise. Oh, OK, so yes, yeah, so, all right. So phase one, turn it all off. Phase two, uh, we know you turned it off, but turn, we didn't mean turn everything off, to put, turn back on the really critical stuff. So, uh, and that was in making sure the cancer uh, surgeries and the diagnostics carried on and some of the screening and vax carried on. Then phase three is very much around now get everything back to pre-COVID levels, but within the context of operating in a COVID world with the infection prevention uh, constraints that that exist so that's the phase three letters so and we've got to get we've got to get first draft we've just signed we're signing off our one we've signed it off yesterday our phase three response has got to go first is in by September the 1st and then final version including response to people plan in by the end of September so in, in terms of the targets that you've been given which yeah. you know effectively get you up to 100 percent of, of a lot yeah. of last year's activity how realistic yeah. do you think those are and and can you just give us a bit of a, an understanding of what the planning process looks like to try and yeah. 
it, de it depends on where you were before you started. And actually, I, I run a system with very fortunate with really high quality providers. So they're all good or outstanding. And I've got really, I've got some of the best general practice in the country. And so, you know, I'm in a very strong quality position. Um, so actually, in terms of our previous waiting list, in terms of 52 weeks, and we had sort of double digits, not triple or more. So we were in a very strong position going into COVID um, and were able, because the, you would have heard that a lot of the independent sector, you know, basically the independent sector were contracted nationally on a direct contract. And because of sorry being sorry, we have an awful lot of independent sector uh, capacity and so we were able to keep going with our complex cancer surgery which means so actually when we submit our plans we will be we we will say we will be back up to 100 percent of capacity as we were pre-covid and that's you know that makes it sound very easy it's not i mean there's been extraordinary amounts of work that have gone on and reorganization and uh and we've had extra money in particular for diagnostics which has been our problem um, so particularly endoscopies and then the weights of the endoscopies have gone up which had, had on the knock-on knock effects on some of the cancer pathways so um so for us for phase three i'm and i my providers although they're um they we don't sign off anything unless we believe it so if they've okay. said they can do it i apps you know we can do it but yeah, i think fantastic. that's i think that's unusual i do think that's unusual yeah okay and i mean it's a really positive positive message to hear and probably not the, the response I was getting to be honest and, no. and as you say, different places will we'll yeah. have different perspectives in terms of obviously you can do so much to get the capacity there in terms of yeah. patients coming in to fill that capacity yeah. do you expect there to be challenges around that yeah I mean notice as I kept on doing um I carried on doing my day a week in general practice throughout COVID all the way through and and well, everybody, you know, we moved to digital digital triage, basically every single patient. So, you, so we've we kept up the face to face, but I've always had first contact being either via email or via uh, via phone. And it's interesting, sort of the change to start off with. People were frightened and didn't want to come in. Now they want to come in to general practice, but there is still um, I'll still have one or two conversations per surgery with people saying. That I'm meant to go for my MRI or I'm meant to go for the cystoscopy. Do you think it's safe? Okay. Um, so there is still, and so there's the people are worried about infection risk, but actually our, our levels locally are really low at the moment. But then there's also, and now I've got the changes in the uh, how long you have to self isolate for. It is better, but there were a lot of self employed people that could, that were saying, I can't afford to take that amount of time off. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. So, Thinking about your priorities as a, as a system, can you just give us an indication of maybe what they were up till about the 20 somethingth of March or whenever it might have been mm -hmm. um, and how that's changed and, and, and when you see you might be getting back to those initial priorities? Yeah, so bizarrely, almost the, the before lockdown, the, the week before lockdown, we had a system away, a lock-in, um, <laughs> which because, and that was to do the that was part of the uh, coming to the end of the old planning round that actually then got abandoned because we entered um, COVID. Which and it was the at that time our biggest priority was we had a 60 million system gap in our planning that we couldn't meet uh, because we, had the, we were doing more activity than we had money for. And actually the conversation was so how are we going to do this differently? And by what was and and the uh, and we had a, a two days facilitated by an army planner which then when you then rolled the clock forward by a number of weeks, army planners were everywhere. And and, uh, and at the end of it, we'd, we'd decide uh, where we got to was we needed to uh, increase the speed of flow of people, you know, increase hospital discharge. Uh, we needed to further integrate um, where we could. So uh, local authority and the NHS, as well as you know, primary and secondary care, and physical and mental health. So, you know, all the all, all the integration was it, it was very much uh, and with the aim of continuing to improve health inequalities and the thing that fed all the way through it was we need to accelerate our digital transformation so covid then comes along and actually you, you went to the hospitals overnight uh everybody moves to digital first and virtual bit so tick tick uh i'm now doing a restructure yeah, so we we kind of we've sort of accelerated all the things we said we needed to do were actually the things that we have done at pace but i have no idea what our system financial position is when we go into, I know what it is for this year because actually activity gets paid for mm. uh, and it's very much a central bit. But I, I at the moment, which feels slightly uncomfortable, 
I would normally be able to tell you, you know, and this is us, this is where we are and this is how everybody's doing. I don't know going into next, going into phase four, which will be a normal planning round, what that's going to look and feel like for us. So you're just sort of doing what you need to at the moment and then thinking about it later. Is that kind of the, the, the feeling? Well, it is, but, but I think our direction was already set. You know, we, we, we've got a 10 year strategy. We had we've signed off a 10 year strategy with the as our health and well-being strategy this time last year, which was absolutely we'd identified our most vulnerable groups. We had identified our areas of biggest health inequalities. Covid has made all of those things worse. Uh, and I think the only, the other thing that COVID has done, which was already there as a priority, but has heightened it, is obviously is, is those people in institutionalised care. Yep. So, um, and it's not just the care homes. We've got a lot of prisons, uh, and actually uh, an acceleration or and and a lot of learning disabilities homes. So I think I think the the bigger focus is in people that do not live their their normal place of residence is not their own home, and actually how poorly they have how, how much more disadvantaged they've been by covid but also i think it really has it's made me personally much more aware of how badly as a society those people are fed for okay and i mean it's not something i'd, I'd expected to explore today but think about that as institutionalized care piece mm. obviously a lot of those providers I, I assume are independent providers yeah and there's been been lots that we've heard about care homes struggling and providers maybe not not being sustainable um, do you anticipate any of that care coming back to the NHS? Do you see there's an increased burden for you potentially in having to manage well, those populations? Yeah, so the, the other thing with Surrey is 80% of our um, care home places are self-funded, which again is okay. quite unique. So, mm. which means that, and, and during COVID, fewer people chose to go into institutionalised care because of the risks. So, one of the, so we, we created, um, Seacol, so the only Seacol centre during COVID, which is which was, uh, and one of the drivers for that was actually I had a real fear, and as did the the local resilience forum that the LRF, which is so that's that's the NHS, its local authority, its fire, and its police, and uh, who who you know, ran our local incident, and had this real fear that we were going to get catastrophic care home failure, of of a real domino effect. So actually, our thinking behind the Seacol centre at that time was somewhere where we could really safely take the, our most vulnerable and they could be looked after easily. Because that didn't happen, the Seacoles actually um, become very much specialist rehab, and again, in a way that you wouldn't have predicted. So for people that are ventilated for three months, four months, which you, know, you don't, don't normally see on such scale, um, and we'd started off with a normal rehab sort of, you know, um, musculoskeletal rehab, but actually it's been we've had to change the skill mix it's now got neurological respiratory psychological rehab as well as the other bits so it's a the model has morphed in terms of what we use that space for so i mean that that's another really interesting that i i, I suppose is the almost a, a more hidden element of the covid stuff is the mm -hmm. the longer term impact of it do you think that's going to have a significant bearing on what you can do so how much of your plans you'll be able to complete or what you'll be able to do as an integrated care system managing that so, yeah so the, the moment the focus on the plans is very much around elective activity and making sure that you're safe for winter and for a, another wave um but the the thing we've started to look at is our mental health capacity so uh, that already so the the referrals to cam so to the children and adolescent services went down because many of those referrals come from schools but you know uh, that those are going to go up massively and it is our young people that have suffered enormously during covid and we, there were there were clusters of um suicides in kent of young men with um on the autistic spectrum and again it was the, it's the anxiety and the uncertainty uh so we're already seeing in staff you know the rise in anxiety and um but also within the population so the demand for mental health services and voluntary services for all ages and all, all aspects of the workforce, I think is the bit, um, so we haven't underestimated it, but it will be the funding of it because at the moment, the funding is still very much directed towards the acute sector. Yeah, fantastic. Um, in terms of that partnership working and, and all the things that are kind of, I suppose your remit, how, from from your perspective and then more broadly I suppose nationally how do you see the architecture of the the NHS shaping up in terms of ICSs, ICPs, CCGs, FTs, PCNs, uh, anywhere? Yeah well there's, there's, yeah so 
you never you get more than three people that work for the NHS in the room, and you never more than have many heartbeats away from somebody talking about the, what the future configuration of the NHS should be. I think it's the it's the normal pastime, isn't it? Really, um, there's been a lot of talk for a very long time. About, uh, you know, we went SDPs, now we're going. IC, everybody's going to be an ICS by April. Um, there's been talk about legislative change. There's been talk that's been pre-COVID. There was talk about the what was going to go once we got the big government um, majority. Immediately, it was then the so what legislative changes can we get through in this parliament? Because prior to that, it was very much the what can we do by consensus? Because you'll never get a change. So then it was the okay, everybody, what do we want to prioritise in terms of legislative change? And then COVID happened. But there's yep. still the, the conversation is now starting again that there will be legislative change. But there seems to be uh, at one point it looked like there was going to be really very much a push for. CCGs won't exist and all statutory powers will be passed to the ICS. Now, in, and in the phase three letter, it, it talks about there being one CCG per ICS, which is, oh, I think that's quite unhelpful, really, because it sort of misses misses the point of the. So, uh, it, it's what is the role of a commission within an integrated care system, and um, I believe that the commissioner should be integrated wherever possible with local authorities. So, for me, because we are we have a a local authority, a very large local authority, that integration happens at system level. But if you're like my neighbours in Sussex, so Adam in Sussex has got, he's got three local authorities. So it's absolutely right for him to integrate his, to integrate his commissioning function at that level and then bring those all together as an ICS. But if you then go, we want a single CCG per ICS because it makes it look neat, you lose that local working. And so that's why you need to be able to have um, be clear what the role of the CCG is within the ICS, but the more prescriptive you get, it doesn't always work. And, I, and I, uh, my big thing, I would like all ICS is actually be co-terminous with the LRF, so with the Local Resilient Partnership, because that's been one of the things that's been really clunky for us. And you have to assume you know, some, this, uh, that COVID will happen again, there will be other, or there will be something similar. But because we don't quite, because we have um, another ICS that cuts off the bottom bit of, of um, Surrey, you then have to duplicate and mm. you increase the amount of resource you need, which, which is fine. And you could, we can do it and everybody can do it but in an ideal world. If you could go co-terminus, it would be it would be neater and easier. Yeah. OK. Can you can you just explain very briefly the role of the local resilience partnership? So the local resilience. Yeah. So um, in I'm saying peacetime. So in less urgent times, you have uh regular meetings so it's the emergency planning piece and it's re normally led by for us it's uh, the 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 lead has always been the um the chief the, the fire service have always taken the lead for it but in as part of covid as part of our emergency planning the um the lrf then stood up a strategic coordination group which we all took it in turns to chair so local authority nhs police and um, fire and it is all of the public sector working together and actually you have a different mission depending on whatever the disaster is so for this the mission was to support the NHS so all of partners were all working together to make sure that I had everything that I needed so it meant things like the fire brigade uh, doing the deliveries of PPEs between the hospital or, or going around and collecting uh, things in terms of looking after shielded patients making sure uh, we were mounting the hotline so that shielded patients could get the support that they needed or to, to marshal the volunteers to go around and visit. So very practical. Uh, and also in terms of obviously around the care homes in creating a coordinated single response. So as things have got better, we've stood that down. It's now just a weekly call, but we're, okay. we're always ready. You know, it will it will stand back up. Uh, and it was it was um, the LRF. It was the LRF mechanism that we did the Headley Court, the Seacoast Centre. So that was in 35 days from nothing to fully operational, 35 days, because you've got everybody that you need. And that included part of that remit, which uh, was excess death facilities. So when the modelling first came out and the excess deaths were as alarming as they were, finding uh, appropriate places to store bodies became an absolute priority. Mm. And yeah, that okay. was where... That was where working with, with the partners actually and the police worked incredibly well. Yeah, that, I mean that's that's one of the the huge positives, I some positive stories mm -hmm. of, of what's happened over the last few months. Uh, just thinking about the the local authority piece, I think amongst our audience, there's a lot of questions around 
how the NHS and local authorities will come together, you know, who who carries the influence, mm. who's going to be doing what work. Can you, you've talked about the, the good relationships you've got mm. locally. Can you just give a bit of a an overview of sort of where, who does what, um, where responsibilities lie, how you make decisions between you with the local authorities? Yeah, yeah so, so we're, we are unusual because the leader of the council is the independent chair of the ICS. So we, uh, so Tim Oliver, um, he's my chair, he chairs the Health and Wellbeing Board. So we use the Health and Wellbeing Board as our overarching uh, most senior decision making body with the ICS board sort of taking on the more of the, um, the nhs -y bits of it, but then coming together and we've, in, we've joined the Health and Wellbeing Board has also got the local safety boards as well. So again, bringing in the police, bringing in all of those partners so you can make sure you do the you know, affect the whole whole of the wider terms of health so at the moment we make decisions through we have a joint commissioning committee uh, we'd moved pre-covid to having a single integrated children's team so that uh, that at that time was under the leadership of the the statutory children's role within the council and he had um in his gift had all of health all of the local authority to create a single integrated team both for commissioning and for delivery and actually what we're now doing is accelerating that across chc across mental health and learning disabilities and autism uh, across carers uh, and and then the director uh, the the das role the adult social care role we're going to create as part of my when i as i do the restructure which we're out to consultation at the moment for that will be one role that reporting to me and into joanna killian who's chief exec of the local authority Okay, fantastic. So just thinking in terms of those different work streams you've mentioned there mm. and who leads them, mm. is that fairly self-explanatory or is there a lot of discussion around who should be having what? No, it, it, no so it's because we've done it to, I think it's because we've done it together. Um, so for the partnership bit, so, so the children's bit, that I think that was probably influenced by um, leadership. Uh, and personalities at the time, which made it a really good test case to try and see how we got on. And actually, it, as a principle, we should be doing things together. And if you can unite the budget through a single role to carry that ambiguity that has to then make things work for both, it makes it it makes it easier rather than going through very convoluted Section 75 agreements or anything else. You can sit the ambiguity in an individual. Yeah, OK. So I suppose picking up on that, um, it might be a very simple answer. Or it might be a, an impossible answer. Um, where do accountability and responsibility lie for patient care in, a, in an ICS? So at, the, yeah, yeah, no, no. so at the moment, because the ICS is not a, so there's a moral responsibility isn't there? and there's a legal responsibility. So the statutory responsibility sits within the statutory organisations, which is why it's really hard. So the so the trusts are all statutorily responsible and the CCG is statutorily responsible. However, in my role as ICS lead, I am accountable to region for delivery of finance equality and the money, and finance quality and performance, as well as of the delivery of improving the health outcomes. And Tim Oliver, as leader of the council, would say he is accountable to the population democratically to improve the health outcomes of the population. So that sounds to me like there are different accountabilities, different responsibilities, and you're all kind of in it together. Is that how it feels? Yeah, it, 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 no, it, it feels, it feels really, it does feel really tricky. Uh, and it is the, it is the thing that, that you always know, even think, I always know when things aren't going quite as well as I'd like them to, because people start to retreat into, but it's my statutory duty. Yeah, okay. Um, I can't possibly agree to that. My board <laughs> wouldn't let me because it's my statutory duty. And then that's when, you know, you've got to pause and stop and go around the loop again and make sure everybody's signed up for the right reasons. Yeah, okay. So it's a, it, I suppose it's a, until there's that statutory change and, and there's legislative, exactly. legislative exactly. change, then, then it'll always exactly. be Exactly, and, and you've, and you've still got um, you've still got in terms of national directors, national directors that will go direct still to trust. The region are good, so the region, our so southeast region, um, I think are very good and inclusive. So the southeast plans are an amalgamation of all of the six system plans. Um, Anne Eden, as regional director, includes 
the ICS leads within her executive team, it is it is feels inclusive, but some of the national directors will go will go straight to the trusts and will bypass yeah. both region and the ICS, which makes that so so that makes it really tricky because they'll suddenly be rushing off and answering a return to go into the centre that nobody else knows anything about. And actually there may be a a slight different variation of the same thing that's being asked so people end up running around which isn't helpful right okay okay so um I, I, it, it's not the simple answer that, that it may have been but um, no, I, I sorry think, no no absolutely I, th I think it's it's much better to get the uh the full complexity of it because we really get better understanding so having having covered off accountability the other big big mm. one is budgets um mm. it's one thing that i think a lot of our audience are very interested in is how budgets are evolving. Um, mm. Can you just give us a, a brief summary of how... Well, I'd love to, but we don't know yet. We yeah, honestly, right, we don't okay. know. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're still waiting for the financial, financial framework to go with the phase three letter, so we know bits of it, but we still don't know the full context of it. And the thing that has been different, so during COVID, everybody, everybody got moved onto a block uh, and everybody got paid for the activity that they did. Then we had the direct national effectively the, the centre put all it took removed local commissioning and and held contacts directly with all the independent sector and with uh with, with any provider really um and we haven't yet got the financial framework for phase three uh so we don't know so we know the block will continue until april but that those are the conversations that are going on at the moment so yeah okay so i mean conceptually i suppose there's the the, the concept of a system total um yeah. practically or pragmatically whichever it might be in terms of all the provider organizations commissioner yeah. organizations buying into that and being able to execute things in in that way mm. what needs to be done to allow decisions to be made in that way about money um yeah so so we, the the past two years and then the planning run we were just going into you given a system control total but organisations were also given organisational context with, and and as an ICS we had the ability to alter organisational control totals, but there nobody's going to let you do that um, uh, because yeah um, we did get I have managed to move money around between organisations. So back in the year when we had um, uh, the PSF, the Provider Sustainability Fund, which was if you know if providers hit their landmarks, then they then got the bonus bit and actually because we moved money around to bring as much money into the system as we could we maximized the amount of money coming in and then used that bonus money to then fund uh, some digital things in primary care and some capital so the, the, that, that extra money that came in because of the flexibility of other people we then maximized around the system so that was probably about as creative as we've got. So are you not quite yet in a place where you can look at moving money towards prevention and oh, well, other means of delivering no so i think it's, a, it's a, so i think if you just talk about shifting money you'll never do it so okay. it is it is the how you, because while you've still got organizational bits and and it is the so the, the phase that we've got to for this april will be each one of the icps has their money through a single contract and it is up to that place how they distribute that money. Uh, and previously, uh, the Guildford and Waverley patch chose to invest in a locally commissioned service for the GPs that looked at frailty. Uh, and so that was very much looking at the prevention agenda. But but it's that you have to make prevention everybody's business. Uh, and that so it's the when you're looking and when you're counting and when you're being it, and it and it isn't and it isn't just blanket prevention because so that. So if in sorry, if I put in a blanket prevention, I, I will make my health inequalities worse because those people that comply will continue to comply and will get more healthy. You know, so they will be even more active, run around, you know, eat even more healthily. And those that don't comply because of the way you're providing it, so that gap broadens. So to overall improve the health across Surrey, I need to target the intervention, so the prevention interventions by communities and that you can only do by working with communities so um, one of the things we've invested in has been the with the there's a Surrey Minorities and Ethnic Forum so there are 52 small ethnic uh, minority ethnic forums around Surrey which are so small because of Surrey being how it is actually again 
their outcomes are terrible and um, because there are, there, and there are no there are no networks for them because the numbers are so small so it is so we need to make sure we target the support for them which will actually be the way that we improve the outcomes across the whole piece so yeah okay so funding money intervention you know, per se you can make it worse you've got to be really careful that you understand your population and then don't presume that we know what's best so our second biggest minority group is gypsy roman traveler population okay. so we invested last year in uh a couple of people that have gone out and have worked with the communities and in the end of the you know, first couple of months it really was just going having a chat and saying hello and then in time started going with so we've now got a, a gypsy roman traveler population that have had vaccinations because the trust has been built uh, and uh, measuring blood pressure it is going to the mosque to have people's blood pressure measured because those are the communities that are most at risk so that's why it's not as simple as saying you need to put more money into prevention what you need to do is to um have the people that work within your system working in a different way and they might be from the acute trust they might be from wherever but you just need to target the intervention rather than just worry about the money yeah okay so so in terms of defining the population needs because this is a conversation we're, we're often having about how you mm. how you find those patients and there's a lot of focus uh, or has been in, in recent years and, and still at the moment around the data you, you, yep. you search for those patients one way or another do you still do a lot of that work or is it much more the 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 sorts of things that you've been talking about the engagement with those groups so i think we've done our data so i think we know so um, our public health department are you've got a really strong public health department um jsna is really and i think it's probably because it is one local authority so um you know down at uh ward level I, you know, we, we know and then um, the primary care networks again because our primary care is quite advanced they're doing the population health management you know the NHSE pilots so again uh, we're not quite there yet but we will be where each primary care networks knows what their three biggest health inequalities are and will then target the interventions for that and coming out of Covid we're going to do a, we will have a locally commissioned service that will um, ask general practice to do holistic reviews on their most at risk and vulnerable patients to you know, looking at cardiovascular and diabetes but targeted within populations okay fantastic um so thinking about you've given some really good examples of things that you've done within surrey where do once you've defined the needs and de sort of defined your populations where do mm -hmm. ideas come from and, and then how do they actually gather momentum to the point of being implemented that's a good question isn't it very good question um so there are loads and loads of good ideas out there aren't there but i think the ones that stick are the ones that come from either the people that are to the grassroots clinicians that's where it comes from or it comes from the communities it's good well if we just did the, you know it's a conversation with um food banks and well why don't you come and do the flu give the flu jabs at the food bank I can, you know, or, or why don't you come and, you know, it's like the blood pressure, why don't you come to the mosque and measure with blood pressure at the mosque, you know, it's that kind of stuff. So it is, so they come through conversations and they come through networking, they come through relationships, but it comes back to, it's, you can't do top down with this stuff, it just doesn't work. So are there any things that top down does work for? Uh, well, we know don't we you know things like uh, making the law that people wear seat belts uh, banning smoking in public places that has a far bigger impact than any small inter intervention that we can do so you know one of the things you know, the number 10 task force talking about is, is is there any big legislative sweeping changes you know can we could you outlaw smoking full stop you know that if those, those kind of really bold statements will have more impact longer term than any small thing i could do but in terms of at a system level um i think because the quality so the the big important bit so it's a wide terms of health so you need to health the nhs on its own can only improve people's health outcomes by 20 percent, and 10 percent of that improvement will come from making sure the right people have access the care so you know, it doesn't matter how many millions of pounds you spend on having the perfect cataract or a perfect diabetes pathway if somebody is homeless or if they're frightened or if they're an alcoholic the health outcomes are going to be a lot worse 
than for somebody that is in you know it, it, the biggest the biggest predictor of your health outcomes is if you are educated employed and ha and and have a house and are safe you know so um it's that this is why an ICS is so important because it has to be about all of the partners and not just the NHS assuming that we know, which I think we have in the past tended to do. Yeah, okay. Um, and in, in terms of that, we, you just referenced partners there and a lot of our, our audience, again, um, very aware of, of the work Right Care has done and, and you yourself yeah. are a former, former chair of the clinical group. Yeah. Um, so in terms of that importance around reducing variation, do you see there's a role for industry to play in supporting the NHS? And what, what might, if there is, what might that role be? Well, that's a good question. Um, so there's definitely a role for industry to play. And we've, we've, we've spent many an agonising month a couple of years ago signing off our uh, working with industry policy as an ICS, which was more painful than it should have been. Um, but in terms of um, uh, reducing variation, I think the best way to reduce variation, unless I'm being overly simplistic with the way I'm interpreting the question, is it is always um, clinicians are really competitive. We are all really competitive. And if you put up a graph and I'm on the wrong end of it, you can you know the next time that graph comes up, I'm not going to be on the wrong end of it. So we have um, Surrey Clinical Priorities Committee, which is all the medical directors, all the clinical leaders, and we bring them together to make collective decisions about so which of the procedures we're not going to do and then blanketly don't do them the the, the, the procedures of limited uh, effectiveness uh, and make single uh, and have a similar thing for the pharma piece so you have the the what it's called the sorry prescribing it's not the sorry prescribing committee but it, you know it's the equivalent piece where all the chief pharmacists all come together uh, so that we make um, so we don't have a postcode lottery in terms of drugs or procedures that we're offering but the the partnership the industry partnership working we've done we did with uh novartis last year so we ran the surrey 500 which is a leadership program um which was a hundred so we spent a lot of time doing the senior you know senior chief exec level buy-in and then i realized that when we came to the planning round it all fell apart the minute you left that sort of chief exec level so put in place a leadership program for that sort of that middle band because actually people working with patients get why you just work together and you want to do it but the bit in the middle it's often where it gets stuck so sorry 500 was 100 people from each one of each icp and 100 people that work across uh from all organizations from voluntary sectors we had librarians we had firemen we had patients we had uh, and coming together to work on a project together and as part of that they did you know, you spend a day in somebody else's shoes and and that has been and, and Novartis put somebody to each cohort, but also they led, they, they did some of the coaching and they led some of the, uh, some of the sessions in terms of their, uh, their uh, internal knowledge as an organisation, rather than necessarily pharma specific knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I think, so that was where we got to with our working with industry piece, people were anxious about working with pharma on specific drugs, but it's understanding that pharma brings many more that has a much broader skill set. Yeah. OK, so is, is that where you really see the value is, is in sort of picking the brains about that broader skill set rather than necessarily looking at specific things with specific group of, groups of patients? Yes. Um, yeah, I think there's still anxiety about doing that. Um, but actually, if you think about things like supply chain and comms and development and all of those skill sets that come from working within global organisations, they're far more advanced than anything we've got within the NHS. So I think there is a there is a role. Yeah. That, but I think that we come from we have come from quite a conserved. I think other systems may be more relaxed than us. But as I say, it was a very painful number of months to get the policy through. And that was that was where we landed. We may revisit at some other point, but that's where it currently sits. Yeah. Okay. So, so do you see that? Has that overall been a positive experience? I mean, not necessarily talking about the specifics of that program, sure. but in terms of building trust, developing a, a readiness to work with industry. Do you think? Yeah, I helped? don't think we've done it well enough yet. I think we're still in. I honestly don't. I don't think we've explored it to its uh, to full capacity yet. So we've got. Um, 
We work closely with the HSN, but not as closely as we could do. I think we have been very much head down and focusing and delivering. And I think it's that as you, and again, it's one of those conversations that have not been, um, just not been at the priority, but I can, we, um, we have the Surrey Hartman's Academy, which is one of the first sort of projects I set up, which is very much, the remit was around leadership, the unwarranted variation, the working with, working with industry uh, and bringing innovation within and uh, into the partnership. Um, and actually they're, they're just starting to sort of, they've come back out of doing the delivering the COVID piece into just starting to look at how and what that might look like a bit further on. So I, I would, we're even in the industry, in infancy, in terms of working in with non-NHS organisations. So the independent sector working that has happened because of the central diktat um, is new, and the ICS has felt quite uh, insular at times. Okay. Given given that I talk about partnership a lot, it is still the partnership is still public sector. Yeah. Okay. Um, and do you think, certainly in the context of everything that's happening in the moment, obviously heads are still probably very much down trying mm. to mm. deal with the third phase and then think about what, what the fourth phase might look like. Do you see now as a good time to be developing those partnerships yeah. with non -NHS? Honestly, no. No, no, leave me alone. Leave us alone. Honestly, please leave us alone for a little bit longer. <laughs> We've got to get the phase three done and sorted and safe. Um, and we've got to, people are really anxious about this winter and of seeing if there's going to be another wave. I would honestly, um, I haven't got the brain capacity to start thinking, you know, I just want to make sure that I know that we're safe and through. I would say it would be coming out the other side of winter would be the right time. Yeah, okay. And I mean, uh, winter is <laughs> obviously something that I know, is I know. rapidly approaching and uh, happens mm. every year, but this this does look like it's... Uh, well, whether it ends up being a different one or certainly it's just yeah. the feeling that it will be. Could you just give us a bit of an idea of, obviously apart from the obvious, what's different, how your planning might be different this this winter to previous years? Yeah. Um, so one of the big things, so we've got the, the critical care capacities, you've got the high end stuff um, and there is, well, we're still uh, going through the funding round for um, extra critical care and there's still talk of the, what will happen with the nightingales and that kind of stuff. So sort of we've got the modelling which again I think is more sophisticated than anything I've seen us have previously and we're even talking about doing modelling within primary care. So uh, we talk about the OPAL status which is the state of a system um, every, on a daily thing which talks about number of beds, number of attendances and we've now we're working up the similar thing for primary care in terms of number of attendances uh, and we've got an early warning system now in place that looks at positive diagnoses, number of one-on-one -on -one calls with respiratory so will, that will then trigger us to stop doing some of the elective things so that we know we're ready. So all of that really feels quite that feels quite sophisticated. But the thing that uh, I'm anxious about in terms of how is, is the vaccination. So flu. So flu, we're doing probably twice as many as we would have done previously. And whereas you know, normally on a Saturday morning general practice, you do one flu jab per minute, we're, we're having to plan for it being one per three minutes. Uh, they haven't quite signed off what the PPE is going to be, uh, but there will be either gloves and hand wash or hand wash in between each one. And they're saying it will be single mask per session. Um, so you've got, you know, you've reduced your capacity. You're then having to do many more. So we're going to have to come up with different ways of delivering flu. And then on top of that, there's also the possibility of the mass COVID vaccinations with difficult uh, cold chains issues. So again, um, you're going to have all that primary care capacity. And although you know, it's, it's not difficult necessarily to train somebody to do a vaccination, you could have all the CQC restraints of when and where you can give uh, vaccinations um, to enable that sort of mass vaccination. So there's you know, the conversation about how you might use testing sites and things to do things differently. So, so you've got winter, you've got COVID, but then you've also got this sort of this routine planned bit, plus the catch up with the screening that you've got to do at the same time. Yeah, okay. Sounds like uh, many different things coming together. Um, yeah. Something that we're hearing from people within the NHS is that there's a lot of fatigue creeping in, burnout yeah. amongst, amongst people that the, the yeah. initial sort of enthusiasm for dealing with, with COVID is, is well and truly gone. Do you think there is the energy within the NHS to do all of that additional stuff you talked about? 
I know we'll do it because we always do, don't we? You know, that's what we do. Um, but it's at what cost? Um, so my team and my CCG staff, I'm trying to get everybody to take at least two weeks leave before winter. So I, a week, because a week isn't long enough because everybody has got, okay. when COVID, when it was really bad, I mean, I've never experienced anything like it, you know, it was, it was frightening. Um, not knowing if it was going to end and the amount of adrenaline that we all had floating around in our bodies uh, and that then carried on just kept us going so I, I had a week off and it took me I think until about the Thursday of that week before I could sort of, but I was still so you know I was very just being very busy um, and then when I finally could sit down without falling asleep it's like then the week was over um, and it's sort of you need and you see people come back and then because they've sort of relaxed and they've lost that adrenaline yeah. protective coating they're then more tired and yeah. you know people will get ill uh and people have been through significant bereavement so you hear of particularly in the hospital staff in terms of the intensive care staff uh there you know and there is um there is mental health support going in but it's not sustainable it's just not sustainable yeah okay and so if you could ask for one thing to help get your system through the winter, what would it be? Hmm. Oh. Um. It depends who I'm asking. Who am I asking? <laughs> uh, I don't know. What would the yeah, most different thing? Okay, so um. So you see, if I'm asked. Oh, no, that's, that's just more money. That's just, you right. need more money. <laughs> it's okay. more money for the workforce. It's more money for the capital. It's more money for the, you know, um, yeah, we need more. We need more money to fund the things that we need to do. If we're going to get back up to these levels, we need more money. But if you're going to talk to the population, it would be the, um, you know, it isn't safe yet. Uh, and also people's patience is going as well. So now on a Monday, um, oh, it's the most bizarre thing. People are, people are losing their rag over earwax. It's just like, it's just, it's just like people want their ears syringing. So they've been really, really tolerant for however many months. And now people are just like, but I just want my ears syringing. And it's like, well, we're not doing that yet because we're still prioritising. And it's like, how could you have got it? Let it get into such a mess. So people are no longer tolerant of the population. So it would be a, so it would be, please, please, please give us more money. Um, please keep yourself safe and it isn't gone away and we're not over it yet but there is also uh and something about the tolerance of how hard it is and how tired everybody is mm. yeah okay i i had to talk my mother down from the the same earwax uh oh, situation God, a couple of weeks ago so it, it's <laughs> true I've, I've experienced it firsthand it, it, <laughs> she, she's a very sensible woman most of the time i know um, but it's and i've had and people have been putting up bizarre things but it's the earwax it's the one that seems to be it's the waffle thin winters, the earwax. You know, I can put up with this, I can put up with that, I can wait for how many, but no, I must have my ear syringe now. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> um, we, we've just got a few minutes left, so there's yeah. a couple of couple of sort of slightly different questions um, just to finish with. Um, one of them is around implementing innovation at scale, which we've kind of touched on, and it's something a lot of our clients are mm -hmm. trying to understand: is how do you take a good idea and get it mm -hmm. to spread? What do you think is the key to achieving that? Oh, it's really hard, and the NHS is really bad at it. So, um, and uh, so the Surrey 500 program I talked about was actually an idea I stole, and and that's really apparently that's really unusual. So, uh, Amanda Doyle, I'm good friends with Amanda Doyle in Blackpool. She's a GP with the same job. We, you know, we are we are good friends. So she she was launching this hundred system leaders in Fylde Coast, and I went up and did the one of the things for her. Um, and then thought, oh, this is really good. I'll bring it back. And and that and it was just bizarre that actually by doing that and then delivering it, um, yeah, that that doesn't happen. So there is something there's something very NHSy about not invented here. And there's some very good reasons in terms of you do need to. Although I brought the idea back, we then shaped it and made it uh, our own. But yet I was quite proud of having brought and spread. Um, and every place is slightly different, but when things are mandated, so there is when the centre mandates, we do stuff overnight. And you look at, you know, you look at the stuff that's happened during COVID, the primary care innovation that has spread, and the video consultations that have spread. Um, 
when things work, they will spread and happen very quickly. Uh, and not everything will work in every place. So is it, That's is not it terribly about, helpful to us. Is it, is it about defining that need and making that need resonate with the people that are are implementing? Yeah. I, I'm think, thinking about the COVID piece. Obviously, everyone got what the need was and it was pretty self-explanatory. So the, yeah. a lot of the objections disappeared. Yeah. But some yeah. of the other things when people sort of talk about, you know, if you, so atrial fibrillation or something about why is everybody not just got everybody on, you know, whatever. Um, and why hasn't everybody just not got everybody properly anticoagulated or has found everybody, you know, has checked everybody's pulse. Uh, and it will be, you need, you need to find an energetic leader to champion it that is of the place. That's mm. what you need. And then it will spread. But that, it's got to be local. If you're going to bring something in, somebody's got to own it locally. Yeah. Okay. And, and just picking up on your your sort of ownership and leadership piece mm -hmm. there, do you in your current role and as a former uh, clinical leader of the year, yeah. could you, <laughs> you, could you, do you do you have sort of three guiding principles on on how to engage people in positive change? Um, three guiding principles. So, um, so you you've, you've got to listen. Do you got to you've got to make sure that the the thing you're changing needs changing so I, I so i love change i'm one of these i you know i love new and shiny but um if other people so it's the case for change so if people don't agree that there is a need you're never going to do it um and also you've got to be as the change happens it's not going to look like the thing you started off with so it's the you've got to build the case and be clear why so you know what's the problem you're trying to solve is it so what is the problem you're trying to solve and get everybody to agree and then actually it kind of it'll happen if you've got everybody to agree that they've got a problem and that it all matters to them kind of your job's done then that sounds yeah. very simplistic tom i'm sorry but it's kind <laughs> it of does, yeah. you know yeah, but actually if if, if if no but i mean if everybody you know if everybody agrees that something is a problem then then you then listen and and you start to build up and you work through and it is this doing the quality improvement piece of trying it and trying it and trying it and trying it. And actually you, it's that continuous improvement thing and never assuming anything is as good as, good as it's ever going to get. But you've got to start with what is the problem you're trying to solve. Yeah, OK. And I, yeah, we touched on that earlier and I suppose that that is the hard part, particularly in, in your setting of different organisations coming together. That piece around sort of continuous improvement and you know, mm. when is when is the job complete? Um, how do you assess that? How do you measure the impact of the it's success? It's never complete, is it? So it's, yeah, yeah. But so so it's, it's never complete, is it? I mean, that's that's the point of system leadership of working in a system of continuous improvement. It can always get big. It will always it will never be uh, as good as it could be. Um, and it's living with that is really important um but how you measure it so you need to again if you have if you just come to it, you've got to define what the problem is you're trying to solve so if you've decided that actually uh our, my learning disability population are dying far too young from heart attacks well that's the problem i'm trying to solve and i will know i've been successful if that life expectancy goes up so that's where that comes back to being what we what are we why are we doing this what are we trying to do and it then means you probably Instead of so when we and 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 I and I did we did this badly. I, you know we used to have sort of twenty eight different priorities and different millions of projects going on, and actually now it's cut it's cuts down to what so what are so it, and and it feels as though you're stalling because you're not doing anything, but actually it's better to wait and aim at three things and do them really well, and other yeah. stuff then falls out of it. Yeah. Okay. Now that's a really really interesting perspective. Um, in terms of so that. That was thinking about, about measuring sort of mm. particular mm. projects. Thinking about your integrated care system and the progress of others around the country, do you measure yourself against success elsewhere? Do you look at what other people are doing? How, of course I do. I'm uh, really is, is there a competition between, of course between there ICSs? Is. Of course there is. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> so I don't know that everybody else would say that, but <laughs> but um uh, I'm very uh, so one of my one of my uh, very best friends is um, Adam Doyle who has my role in Sussex and we are so competitive but actually what that means is we both keep getting better and better and better which is yeah. a really you know it is a 
is a very but yeah i don't know that anybody else is in that game with us i think that's just us. <laughs> well <laughs> if, the it, if it's working for you. it's working for us so that's all fine yeah absolutely yes. yeah so what what are the sorts of things without wanting to share too much in in terms of those conversations how, when you're looking at other parts of the country so i'd be adam yeah. or be um you know yeah, yeah. Parts, what are the things that matter to you in terms of how your systems do so i'm i'm uh it always comes back to the quality of care and the patient care piece so um so can i so i the fact that my all my providers are good or outstanding I, you know i want them all to be outstanding you know the the care we deliver is really good uh it is the waiting times it is the 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 leader reviews it is the you know, it, it it is all it is for me it is always i'm i but i'm a gp aren't i i i will always be i uh, and it sounds really cheesy but you know i i want sorry to be the best place to live and the best place to work so that people mm. want to move here because then you then build up the affluence which then builds up the, the health of the population but also to be the best place to work so that then you then attract the best people so um it, it has to be about it has to be about the quality of care and and actually that because surrey being surrey we we do have good quality of care the thing i will then be looking at is that we're going to have the lowest sums of 52 week weeks we're going to make sure we hit our two-week pathways we're, you know, we're going to whatever else it will be you know we're, we're going to do we're going to do it better whereas sussex um have a much poorer population but adam runs the best process so, so we 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 have uh, you know honestly he, he his governance is extraordinary and it's all it's amazing and it's really really good, uh, and so when you bring those two skill sets together, actually we kind of do all right between us. Yeah, it sounds like a very productive rivalry you've yeah, got there. Yeah, and that, yeah. That's, that, that's definitely the right way to have it. Um, well, th thanks very much, Claire. We've run out of time for today. I've had a fantastic uh, <laughs> afternoon speaking with you, and um, yeah, wish we wish we could have had a bit longer. But um, thanks again. I'm sure Pleasure. that would have been uh, really valuable for our audience. Um, we are back in a month's time on, I think it's the 25th of September. We'll be speaking with Deborah Lee, who is the chief executive of Gloucester Hospitals. NHS Foundation Trust. I think I've got that right. This was a mouthful. Um, hopefully you'll, you'll tune back in then uh, and we'll get a slightly different perspective on, on everything that's changing in the NHS. So thank you at home for listening in and thanks again to Claire uh, and have a fantastic weekend.